name is Kaya Ku. For those who don't know me, I coordinate the Urban Design Studio um, here at GSAP and I, the Fall Urban Design Studio, which looks at the Hudson Valley. And um, I, I just wanted to tell you briefly two reasons why I wanted to have this kind of conversation. One is that um, I would like for all of us to have more dialogue within GSAP across our disciplines between architecture, planning, and urban design. And so this is a, a, an initiative to, to take that step, and it's hopefully only the first in many conversations where we're crossing these boundaries in sort of this more informal Friday lunchtime setting. Um, and then the other reason is that since I've started working in the Hudson Valley and um, teaching a studio about uh, an area that is largely rural, um, I thought that it is interesting to see how much of that work in rural environments we actually all do. And that given that sort of this rural versus urban divide is often in the news as something that is dividing, I thought it would be an interesting way to look at it and see if, if uh, or what architect contributes to the conversation about how it might not be a divide, but how um, urbanization is part of both the urban areas and the rural areas. And so we will all kind of share some projects that are either studio projects or our own projects or thoughts about projects. Um, to generate some ideas and, um, and to kind of kick off a discussion about this topic that will hopefully also continue. And starting off um, the, to frame the conversation is Noah Chasen, who many of you know, um, who took his theory class in the summer. Um, and then um, I will follow with a presentation um, after me, Andres Hapkes, who is the director of the um, AAD program and Galia Solomonov, who's been teaching here longer than all of us um, in Denmark and AAD, and will share some work um, that she's done in the Thanks to Kaya for um, suggesting this idea in the first place. Uh, we had this conversation starting a while ago, and um, it's, uh, it's nice to see it coming to fruition in a slightly modified format. Um, so I, I'm the non, you know, typically in GSAP, I find myself as the non-practitioner, um, as the historian, and you know, historians are going to historicize. So that's what I'm going to do today: try to give a context or a, a set of parameters, theoretical parameters, for um, the conversation that we're going to have. And really, more provocation than anything else. I mean, the projects that we're going to look at from Andres and from Kaya and from Galia. Uh, will really be the, the fundament for what we're talking about today. But I just wanted to give you some thoughts to start to think about while you're um, you know, looking at the projects and also to give a sense of uh, just sort of general ideas around this question of the rural. So I'm going to try, I'm using notes here and I'm flipping over here. So I want to start with something that uh, I think a lot of you have seen, especially in my class, which is the idea of the transect. And the transect is this idea that's coming out of the new urbanism. It is a, um, a form of uh, a kind of understanding the uh, rural-urban divide. And as you can see, as the uh, transect studies people put it, Transect is a cut or a path through the environment showing a range of different habitats. Biologists and ecologists use transects to, to study the symbiotic elements that contribute to habitats where certain plants and animals thrive. And of course also human beings also thrive in different habitats. Some people prefer urban centers and would suffer in a rural place. The whole idea of suffering, first of all, is something that I think we need to talk a little bit about today because there's this... Um, an oscillation between the urban and the rural where sometimes, and this is something I think will come up in a lot of the conversations today, um, the, uh, the preference for, t for living in a rural area versus the preference for living in an urban area and the ways in which there's this oscillation both historically as well as uh, contemporarily. So this notion, and this by the way is language from the tra Center for Transect Studies which is part of the new urbanism in the first place. Um, so people, some people prefer urban centers and would suffer in a rural place while others thrive in the rural or suburban zones and then pr presumably would suffer in the um, urban space. 
This, the uh, Alexander von Humboldt uh, sectional map of the Ecuadorian Andes, in which he gives both atmospheric as well as um, topological and topographical information around the, uh, this journey that he takes throughout South America, which is seen as, in many ways, the first transect study. Uh, and as the Center for Transect Studies says, it is taken from the southern tip of South America, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and is vertically exaggerated. So it's not so much of a transect as we saw even in that earlier. That was like a 10th century Chinese scroll painting, uh, in case you didn't get a chance to look at it, just um, showing. Oh, I guess I can use. I have all sorts of fancy stuff today. Um, you know, the, the transition from the rural to the urban. Um, not wanting to spend too much time on the whole idea of the transect, but it's important to uh, recognize that there is a kind of trajectory or maybe even a teleology behind the notion of transect studies. And uh, you know, I don't mean to be putting this forward. In fact, I'm going to critique it in a moment, the idea of the transect as something that is uh, unassailable and or the inevitable consequence of a rural-urban relationship, but it is something that especially the, uh, the people who conceived of it, the new urbanists have this idea that this is in many ways um, the best way of understanding historically the relationship between the urban and the rural. Moving forward to uh, Patrick Getty's uh, valley section, which has an even more and greater historical resonance in the 20th century. Um, this is the introduction of the human. And this is one of the things I also wanted to bring in. I know that a lot of you read the, uh, the essay by Neil Brenner called Hinterland. And one of the things that, to me anyway, is conspicuously absent in that essay is a uh, conversation around the, um, the individuals that are making up that trajectory between the Hinterland and the urban area. And so I want to convince you and or suggest some certain ways in which the human needs to be reintroduced into that. So Patrick Geddes is one of the people who recognizes that there is this kind of organization of different pr professions. So the fisher, the gardener, the peasant, as you move up into the valley into uh, woodmen and miners. So there is this relationship constructed between the, the human and the, the way in which the, the uh, population utilizes that section. The next uh, in that sort of trajectory would be Ian McHarg's uh, sort of section through from Design Within Nature, that this is more about the, what uh, McHarg or the transect study people would call ecozones, which is, again, now deliberately leaving out the human element and talking about the natural components. Um, and it would only be that the natural components that were left over after their natural utility would be used for, or that were least valuable for this kind of sense of naturalism, whatever that means. And a lot of terms, by the way, that I think are going to come up in the conversation today, nature, hinterland, wilderness, wildness, um, you know, all of which I think is really important to problematize. Um, and not to take it for granted. I mean, I think that's sort of the whole underlying concept of this, uh, this set of dialogues. Um, in this case, the design within, within nature, sorry, the de design with nature is to use the parts of nature that are least valuable as natural resources for the inhabitation um, or the utility of capital production. And then, just make sure I'm... We have finally the, uh, the Center for Transect Studies, uh, Transect, the Smart Code Transect, in which there is this very specific kind of zoning system in which you have these different transect zones, each one of which is organized you know, through, from the natural. I mean, and these two are highly um, suspect and highly artificial zoning uh, Categories: the natural, the rural, the suburban, the general urban, the center, and the core. And this, too, is something that I bring up as a means of critiquing the notion that one can, in fact, categorize and or put those into such rigid um, foundational terms. Um, let me skip over this. 
next one, and suggest that <clears throat> you know, one of the problems with the transect is that it is this very idealizing and linear concept that doesn't really account for the unexpected zones of disturbance or for the, uh, you know, that sort of gray space that exists between uh, and among those sort of interstitial and liminal spaces along the transect. And by imposing this sort of very rigid teleological linear progression, that what it's really doing is suggesting that the relationship between the rural and the urban is monodirectional, um, that it's reinforced by the vectors of capital insofar as those are, uh, you know, determining the movement from the rural into the urban, uh, doesn't take into account the necessary blurring of the lines between those different zones or those different uh, T, T components and um, between what were heretofore autonomous zones, but now um, we, we need to think about the ways in which these things are dependent on each other. And here's one, the first of several uh, quotes that I want to share with you that I think will help to um, articulate these ideas a little bit better. So this is a quote from the poet and naturalist Wendell Berry from his book Home Economics. <clears throat> in which he writes, the awareness that we are now slowly growing, the awareness that we are slowly growing into now is that earthly wildness that we are so complexly dependent upon is at our mercy. It has become, in a sense, our artifact because it can only survive by a human understanding and forbearance that we now must make. The only thing we have to preserve nature with is culture, and the only thing we have to preserve wildness with is domesticity. Um, and there is this, um, you know, really kind of resilient why is this not working? Uh, notion of the ways in which the rural needs to be um, maintained, and not just the rural, but the wild or the wilderness or the wildness. Um, this is, uh, and I, I want to suggest the ways in which those. Um, sentimental and or nostalgic categories are in fact counterintuitive and counterproductive. This is uh, a quote from a book by George Monbiot, who's written a lot of really good things about, uh, about cl the climate crisis. This is from his book called Rewilding, in which he's talking about the uplands of Wales, specifically an area that has been conventionally agricultural um, and that has been experiencing a sort of downturn of fortunes. The uh, Mambio, and I'll, read you, I'll first kind of contextualize it for you, he argues two things. First, that environmentalists are arguing that the flooding of these areas are due to the climate crisis and therefore making them less uh, available for agricultural purposes, uh, specifically these two rivers that come into the area, the Severn and the Wye. Uh, that, but in fact, it's the overgrazing of the land by uh, an abundance of farmers that are using this for sheep farming that's having the greatest impact on soil erosion. And so the second thing is, of course, that grazing is a part of a, a sort of sentimental attachment to an agrarian lifestyle in these areas that people are accustomed to. And so... Um, the support for this persistence of the agricultural imaginary is ironically overshadowed by the fact that the wildlife tourism brings in as much, uh, much more income to the British economy, in fact, five times more. So if you read the text, grazing is one of the least productive uses to which the hills could be put. Despite the vast area it occupies and the subsidies it receives, uh, farming in Wales contributes just over 400 million uh, to the economy, whereas if you look down a little bit lower, you'll see that um, wildlife-based wildlife activity, which is tourism, uh, the walk, walking, um, you know, other forms of utilizing the land for uh, recreational purposes, actually brings in uh, you know, 1.9, what is that, 1.9 billion dollars, I guess. Um, and the National Ecosystem Assessment shows that across most of the upland of Wales, switching from farming to multi-purpose woodland would produce an economic gain. In other words, the current model of farming, far from being essential to the rural economy, appears to brag it, drag it down. The barren British uplands are a waste in two senses of the word. Um, again, this, this uh, 
idea that the the, the, the maintenance of an agricultural lifestyle is endemic to that site and therefore needs to be propagated when in fact there's demonstrably a much better usage of it, uh, which doesn't which in fact encourages this um, a different kind of sentimentality and a different kind of nostalgia, which is the escape from the city into the wildness or the, wil the, the wilderness of that area. Um, go a little bit forward and talk about um, migration. So migration, this is from a, uh, a study called Scaling Fences, Voices of Irregular African Mig Migrants to Europe, which talks about um, the ways in which the, the migration um, patterns, which you see, uh, many of the people from this study were from Benin City, and so I've identified that on the map. <coughs> But the places to which they go, which are primarily Spain and Italy, are very resistant to allowing them in. Um, and this is yet another problem that we have with regard to the um, understanding of the population of the rural and the urban. That in fact, most of the people that are coming from these areas are from urban <coughs> environments. And they're coming into uh, not only cities, but also into you know, foreign land, irregularly, meaning not following the typical routes of migration. And they're asking to be integrated into the local economies um, with primarily an urban experience. And there's this, uh, you know, I think, a, a kind of conceit that immigrants coming in are not necessarily acclimated to an urban lifestyle, therefore they're expected to be working more in the agricultural sector, which in fact is not what their training is whatsoever. Um, so th this relationship between migration and the city uh, is a, another complicated one. I'm just reading here. Migration is a historic and multifaceted phenomenon involving humanitarian, human rights, and demographic issues. It's not so much necessarily about the urban versus the rural as it is about these underlying and you know I, I think it's important to acknowledge the human rights issues has a deep economic environmental and political implication generates many different legitimate and strongly held opinions and not always the strongly held or legitimate and not always the legitimate legitimate strongly held um, <clears throat> I want to make sure I'm not going over do we have uh no idea how long I've been talking. What's that? No one's keeping time. No one's keeping time. Okay. Um, so let me. Again, I'm just. I'm really trying to give some provocations here, rather than um, trying to make any bold statements necessarily. But um, if we look at Benin City, you can see that even the parameters of it, you know, begin in, in the last 20 years, starting out in 2000 with the yellow and then increasingly creeping outwards, we see that there is this um, inability to really identify what even constitutes the city of Benin City. This is a city, you know, right on the, on the coast, just not a little bit south of Lagos. Um, and so thinking of urban uh, citizens leaving there, the urban is no longer something that is simply located at the core, but is rather something that becomes increasingly peripheral. Um, once again, problematizing the notion of what constitutes the city versus the, um, the outlying areas. <clears throat> and as we think about this notion of migration, we also have to think about the relationship of climate crisis uh, to both migration as well as to the urban and rural. And what I want to sort of end with here is the idea that most of the, uh, the migration that's happening in the world is happening from rural to urban, um, despite what I was suggesting before. And yet it's those urban areas, especially those along the shoreline, that are the most unstable and the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable to climate change. So as we have this rural to urban migration, we also have the kind of forces pushing people out of the city. 
Um, because of the increasing likelihood of them being uninhabitable, and I have several different images that show just the different uh, loci, um, places of uh, vulnerability, of altered shoreline, of numbers of people living close to the shoreline. And I think that one of the things we need to consider as we're talking about this rural urban, and I, I, by the way, we're, we're going to be talking about this in a sort of global sense, and I'm certainly talking about it in a more global theoretical sense as well, but it's also something that's very grounded in the sense of uh, the, the, the vulnerability of cities and the ways in which they are both taking in immigrants but also facing the, the very real possibility that those immigrants are no longer, along with the existing residents, uh, no longer going to be able to inhabit those cities. And so you have, and, and, and this is you know very significant crisis, so you have, uh, for example, about 2,000 refugees from rural Bangladesh moving into Dhaka, into slums in the peripheral areas per day. Um, and yet Dhaka itself is uh, you know, already um, in a very perilous situation. So that kind of rural to urban movement in some ways is going to give way to a necessary uh, spreading out of the city and uh, a necessity of understanding different ways in which to incorporate and to absorb these massive amounts of Immigrants. I mean, this is true also of, I'm just skipping through stuff because I want to let everybody else have a chance to talk, um, but uh, immigrants leaving from the Tan Him refugee camp in Thailand, uh, primarily um, Karen people from, the, from Myanmar uh, who have been um, religiously persecuted, and their re- Location to places such as Chicago, San Francisco, New York, Jacksonville, Hartford, Omaha, Fort Wayne, and Ithaca. So also thinking about not major cities. This is another thing, and maybe this is where I'm going to end, is not uh, that when we talk about the rural urban, we have to realize that cities are of many different scales. Um, even when we think about the U.S. context, we're not talking just about New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, Dallas, but these are cities as well that have their own specific and autochthonous relationships to the uh, periphery. And so with that, I want to, uh, let me see if there's just one more quote that I can, uh, maybe I didn't have one more. Uh, anyway, I'm going to leave it there. But what I what I would like to um, leave you with is simply this. Uh, well, not this image, but the idea that is provoked by this image, which is just one um, of a number of studies, regional studies, on about the environment and climate change and the vulnerability of these spaces. Just thinking about how. Um, populations are going to be, or, or the question of the population is going to be problematized in uh, these various areas and the, the, the complications in particular with regard to the urban and the rural that I've mentioned before, rural residents or rural uh, em emigrants coming into the city but then finding themselves in a situation not only of um, a lack of uh, of employment opportunities, but also into deeply unstable environmental conditions. Um, anyway, okay, that was a little bit all over the place, but hopefully it gave some, uh, some stuff to think about, and hopefully this will act as a kind of backdrop to the projects, which are much more grounded and specific and focused, and um, that we're going to see from Kaya, Galia, and Andres. So thank you very much. I already feel very provincial um, taking our conversation from the global to Germany. So what, what I wanted to share with you is um, the role that architecture and architects can play in rural areas using the example of um, a model that is um, over 100 years old called um, IBA, Interna Internationale Bauausstellung, or the, an international building exhibit which is a framework that um, has developed over time in Germany as a way of using architecture to revitalize cities mostly um, or to sort of demonstrate 
um, a new way of life often to a general audience. So um, before I go into um, the IBA Thüringen, which is a state in Germany that is currently ongoing um, and, and really focuses on um, a rural environment, I want to give a brief uh, history of what these international buildings exhibits are. And so here's an image of the first one, which was an artist colony in um, Darmstadt. Um, so together with this sort of uh, grand exhibition uh, hall, this is an, an opening ceremony. Um, there was a number of uh, artist houses in that neighborhood. Um, they're still being used as residential houses then. At the time, this, so this was the time of Jugendstil, Art Nouveau, and it was sort of trying to demonstrate what was then envisioned as a modern way of living. Um, followed in 1927, this is one of the most famous um, international building exhibits where um, modernist architects from all over Europe came together in Stuttgart, also a relatively small city in Germany, to build the Weißenhof Siedlung. Um, here is, the, you know, this is an example. These are the two houses um, built, designed by Le Corbusier and Pierre Jeannery that still exists. Um, I believe uh, one of them is a museum now. All of the other houses are occupied. Um, and, and here again, sort of the, the drive was really to demonstrate um, a, a modern way of living. The, what was dictated by the organizers was the flat roof. Um, but I don't think any of the architects participating in this exhibition were, had to be convinced to use a flat roof. That was sort of the mantra and also really sort of the, the uh, it was very much sort of a, a style of architecture and a showcase of architecture. Um, I'll show one more as an example of how this has changed over time. There were several in between um, in Berlin actually um, focusing primarily on housing. Um, what really changed the scale of some of these exhibitions was this one um, in, um, uh, in the west of Germany, which was the, sort of the Rust Belt of Germany and which took on an entire region to demonstrate how this industrial architecture can be used for public purposes. Um, the Iba Emscher Park, and this is an image of a playground um, next to a decommissioned industrial facility. Um, and so this was a large 800 square kilometer landscape park. Um, but now I really want to focus the attention to um, this uh, current um, Iba. And so I want to say that between the earlier ones that were really showcasing architecture, and there are still a number of Ibas that are doing this, this framework of using the idea of an exhibition to be a catalyst for a place for change has really taken off. I think currently there are, um, there are sort of at least five simultaneous international building exhibitions going on in Germany and, and neighboring countries. So there's one in Vienna, um, Basel, which is sort of a tri-state exhibition. And they all go over a number of years, as you can say, starting with conceptualizing, <coughs> developing project ideas, um, and eventually mm -hmm. Um, the completion of buildings and, and so what, or buildings or parks or projects um, to a larger extent. And what you can see in this one is that it's really sort of shifting the framework from the idea of completed projects um, as buildings to being a facilitator to really envision change together with residents. And so this is a state, um, it's in the center of Germany, really in the center of Europe. Um, as you can see on this map, um, it was, is what was the former East. It is a state also that, um, this is what this map is supposed to show, that is heavily forested. It doesn't have any large city. Um, so it's a, it's a conglomeration of small towns, um, and it, it's experiencing what a lot of rural areas all over the world are experiencing, which is the opposite of you know, people moving to the city, which is a decline in population and aging of population. The average age in the state is, uh, or the median age is close to 50, 49.9. Um, this compares to New York where it's about 30, 36, I believe. Um, it you know, has over 45,000 vacant buildings across the entire state. Um, has in, in, you know, 40,000 jobs in the forest management and wood <coughs> timber industry. So it's sort of a, a different scale of living, a different economy. One of the other interesting facts that this, that's on this map is that one in three residents in the state are engaged in some sort of nonprofit civil society activity. So there's a, a, a huge interest in um, working sort of for the common good. 
And this is really what this, um, inter this international building exhibit um, um, sort of set out to do when it was formed in 2012. It's sort of ha you know, thinking about forms of participation and how um, they can um, act as a facilitator and as a catalyst to um, use, uh, to create resource, well, they're calling it resource conscious projects with values oriented towards the common good. And so they're using the international building exhibit as a brand, but also as sort of a, a, a way of attracting talent into rural areas that often do not have it. There's, um, so one of the places in the state is Weimar, the um, place where the Bauhaus was founded. Um, and an architecture school still exists, but beyond that, um, there isn't a lot of sort of design, planning, and architecture talent, and these small towns and villages don't necessarily have the professional staff that they could sort of, you know, write just the design brief for a design competition, or even do a feasibility study for what their towns need. And so this is really what, in this case, rather than sort of just sort of commissioning these large um, and prestigious projects, um, the primary focus of this international building exhibit was to sort of catalyze and, and, and be project managers for processes that where the people that want to be engaged can participate in the change in their, their towns and villages and landscapes. And so I want to show um, a few examples that I think are sort of prototypical of building typologies that you find in these rural areas and, and show a little bit of um, what they have been doing. And since this is an ongoing uh, process, um, a lot of it is also um, work in progress. Um, the first one is industrial buildings. Um, and industrial buildings that, you know, here in New York are often being used, but, you know, discovered. Um, by artists and, until they turn into expensive housing. In a small village, they, remain, they are vacant. This is, uh, used to be a mill originally. Um, then for, in its last industrial use, it was um, a factory for fire extinguishers has been vacant for 20 years. Was designed by one of, Egon Eiermann is one of uh, um, Germany's uh, rather famous uh, modernist architects in the middle of nowhere. It's a small village of 15,000 people. And so it's really difficult to sort of envision a new use for this. And here, um, the um, IBA um, invited <coughs> architects from Berlin for a workshop to sort of generate ideas of what could happen here. And, and these are some of the early sketches to begin calling it an open factory and take this on as a project where it was clear this has to develop over time and over a long period of time to sort of see what kinds of different uses can come into the space and make use of what is you know, a really nice building um, but, but also very difficult to program with a large big company. Um, one of the first sort of physical interventions that they did is that the project management team of the building exhibit um, it themselves moved in and realizing that it would be really difficult to heat a large building, industrial building like this um, efficiently. So instead they installed these sort of like uh, Home Depot greenhouses um, inside the office space that during the winter months the, the larger um, floor plate isn't really heated um, but heat is in, in these little greenhouses is generated mostly through the off heat from their computers um, and potentially you know a small additional electrical heating on the floor and this was a way how they could begin to occupy this really large space um, over the course of the last two years and then here's kind of a floor plan diagram of what the you know, one entire floor of this building now looks like. And, and different greenhouses have different functions. So some are office space for two people and other are meeting rooms to sort of begin to just occupy and use the space again and be present for others to participate. And then another um, project they have started is that they invited um, artist collectives or architecture offices to turn the building over the summer months into a hotel and a space of experimentation where this idea of a factory can really be tested. And so this becomes, so this is the hotel lobby um, improvised. All the furniture um, was built by um, sort of workshop participants. So um, art, artists um, take up the, you know, being the directors of the hotel for a week or two weeks and invite different activities to happen in the space. And the activities are usually 
developed around creating um, equipment or furniture to be able to activate the space. And so a lot of it also then stays in it and allows the next users to continue working with that. Um, this is another example of what I also think is um, a sort of typical of this rural environment where there's a much greater consciousness of working with the materials that are local. And I mentioned earlier, um, forest and timber industry is a really big uh, part of this particular landscape. And so trying to understand how architecture can be, you know, sort of modern, but also um, work with the traditions of building um, in a region like this is something that the EBA was trying to promote through this project. What you're seeing here is um, a, a medieval castle um, that, um, similar to the factory actually for um, a long time had no owner or no use um, and this, this has to do with complicated uh, German history of uh, uh, East and West and, and um, sort of you know the, the owners of the the owners of the castle leaving the country and it, it kind of lay fallow until after reunification this young person now all of a sudden found himself to inherit this property. He happened to be an architecture student at the time, and so it developed into a place where he himself is experimenting with architecture. Um, and one of the projects they completed recently as part of a design built workshop um, with a nearby architecture school is the former um, sheep barn that is now being used as a place to stay overnight for that same design build workshop. So since 2012, they invited architecture students to stay there for three weeks to build something with them and learn sort of building techniques. And in this case, it's really um, sort of, the goal was to build it entirely out of natural materials. Um, so it's a, a wood frame house, the insulation are uh, is these little clay balls that are used, there's no vapor barrier whatsoever. Um, and it was built uh, with students. Here's an image of the topping off uh, festival where they in, in kind of installed these swings temporarily to um, you know, enjoy the space uh, as it's still under construction. Um, here's an image of the finished place. So the students of the design build workshop um, essentially built the place where the next generation of students next year will then be able to um, sleep. Um, and the entire construction is, is sort of a wood construction that, that is a demonstration of the material of the locality, but also of the practices that were used um, you know, uh, in, uh, d almost a thousand years ago when the original castle was built, um, both a nod to the tradition, but also a nod to being very um, you know, climate conscious with construction. Here's a floor plan of the... So one thing that they said on the site was originally a, a sheep barn that was um, that that was so dilapidated that they had to demolish it. And then, as they were building a program in the castle, what they realized is that we have a very successful cafe that we're running now, but we only have one bathroom. We don't really have a kitchen, and so this building enabled them to sort of add all these uses in addition to the space that I showed in the image earlier, where you can stay overnight. Um, another sort of typical typology, especially in Europe, that you find all over the place is every village has a church. Um, and like in many other places, congregations are shrinking. Um, they are sort of the landmarks of their villages and towns. They're the tallest buildings. They're in the center of the village. Um, and so this, uh, this project, was and is well, was a competition to generate ideas of what to do with churches in this region. 99% um, of the about 2,000 churches in this region are landmarked. And so this ideas competition, um, and the image shows the exhibition um, subsequently of some of these ideas, um, was to, what, what can we do with these places other than being um, churches that are difficult to maintain with dwindling congregations, how can they continue on being significant markers in the community? Um, and so here's one um, idea that I want to show. So art is an obvious sort of um, idea that many people showed. Here's another one that's kind of a twist to it. 
And this is, um, this is a map of an area that is quite sort of a, it's a hiking trail. Um, it's an area that is used for cross country skiing and, and hiking. And here, one of the ideas was, can we turn these churches into sort of hostels? And can we do this in a way that people who are hiking this entire trail, which will take, you know, take several days, can really just go from village to village and, and stay overnight in the church? Um, and, can we, um, and can we do this in a way that there's some sort of interaction with the local community um, so that you come to the church not just to stay overnight, but you come to have a dinner, to um, participate, you know, to maybe even go to the local library to ha you know, to start a dialogue with people who are in this village. Um, and similar to the factory in the beginning, um, one thing that this international building exhibit does is that it sort of encourages pilots. So he, this is one uh, pilot church that now has this sort of, you know, what, what you don't see here is like you can curtain it off the bed so that you don't sleep in this giant space if you don't want to. But it's, they essentially just build a bed in that church. There's also another area where it has some tables and chairs for communal dinners. But it was an, an, an first pilot to say, well, is anyone in the village even interested in doing that? And they were overwhelmed by the response. And like, how little do we need to start this change to use the church as accommodation, to use this church as a public space? They have movie screenings in the church now and, and sort of regular dinners. And when the architects who came to propose this and, and kind of built the pilot to the site, they started just building this uh, um, little room here. Um, sort of people showed up and said like, hey, I used to be a carpenter. I heard there's someone, you know, my help might be needed here. And so building the space already sort of generated the type of interaction that the project was hoping it would do with the people that come visit. Um, last example I want to show, and this is also something that's quite universal, at least I can think of several train stations in the Hudson Valley that are not really train stations anymore because we have ticket machines. And there are historic buildings, but nothing happens in them. And so this was uh, is a village, I think 500 people um, live here. Um, the train station was empty. The train's still going by, and it's stopping. Um, and it actually unloads a lot of tourists that go hiking for the day in this area. And so here again, the uh, IBA, the International Building Exhibit, served sort of as a project manager to um, attract um, more international ta talent organizing a design competition. It uh, brought in design students to do, you know, what could you do with this train station as a studio project, um, and ultimately help the community to um, apply for grants to create a cooperative um, to turn the train station into a grocery store. Um, because that is also some, a phenomenon that you find in a lot of these rural areas that there isn't any grocery store left. And so now um, the, in the interior is um, a cooperative run grocery store that's run by the community. But you know, the reason all these things are on wheels is that whenever there is a, a community meeting, they just move the stuff out of the way and it becomes sort of the community center and the meeting space. Um, and the image the, that I showed previously is um, the design of the outdoor spaces that was then, it was a competition that was won by a, an office from Berlin to combine the renovation of the interior with a renovation of the outdoor spaces to create sort of this public forum also on the outside. And all of this are, these are really small examples um, where really sort of the role of the, the framework of the building exhibit would, was bringing um, the capacity and uh, to manage to to kind of connect um, a village like this to the design world, to the planning world, and to grants to apply you know to apply for public funding to make these projects happen that otherwise would not happen in rural areas like this. I think this was my last image. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you everyone for coming. But I'm Super happy that Kaya uh, invited me to be part of this and this long conversation that is already been very productive. And I'm really happy that you're bringing this discussion and very, very fun and very, very good fun of the of the work that you're doing in the Hudson Valley uh, with the with the whole kind of uh, urban design people and 
Uh, I'm really happy also that you're promoting this conversation between architecture, urban design, and also bringing different voices and different approaches to it. I'm also very, very, uh, very uh, moved by the work that Kaya uh, sent or Kaya presented, and also by Noah's words that I feel very close to many of the discussions that probably all of us uh, share. I would like to start actually, I mean, with this. Because in a way, uh, this is an image that it's uh, talking of a, a way for the uh, urban uh, to be seen as very isolated, as thinking about itself, let's say, and something that is uh, meant to be only talking about urban realities, about fashion, about uh, uh, finances, about uh, design in many ways. But there's no way for us to think of uh, uh, the, the huge growth of cities in the last years without thinking and making the connection with what is happening in other rural areas that are being urbanized. And this is a photograph of the uh, COVID uh, uh, digital system that is being used by Cabot uh, uh, Gas Company uh, to digitalize and map the uh, mineral assets in Susquehanna Valley. This is in particular a part of the Marcellus Show. This is something equally urban that is very much related to the concentration of power, finance, and technology that is happening through uh, uh, urban constructions that is operating underneath and within the rural. This is actually the way that the same reality is manifested uh, in a particular house that is totally uh, uh, embedded as a or kind of organized as, an er as a rural setting where the same reality is not manifested through the, as a financial asset, but is rather manifested as a kind of difficult to understand a physical phenomenon by which the water of the aquifers is mixed with the uh, uh, methane uh, through the kind of failure of fracking in uh, conduit in this gas uh, to, to basically the places where it is extracted and it's mixed with the water, it's uh, uh, manifested in, the, in, the, in this kitchen as uh, uh, fire. This divide is a little bit more com complex to explain than uh, the kind of classical division between what is urban and what is rural, because it's in the same space. It's happening actually overlap, literally overlap. It's connected. It's actually uh, entangled with each other, but there's a huge divide of power. There's a huge divide of uh, technological uh, mobilization. There's a huge divide of the capacity to take to make decisions. There's many other devices that, devices that are equally formal, equally material, equally uh, spatial, but are overlapped. And this overlapping, it's very difficult to explain, as Noah was saying, with this kind of linear depictions of the division between the rural and the, and the urban. And it's what I think we all are struggling to give sense, to provide with a critical frame, and to find tools to intervene and to bring their traditions of architecture and urbanism, or urban design, urbanity, fairness, uh, legality, policy, uh, accountability, into this sort of space that is so prepared for uh, resisting all these forms of civilization. Uh, this is the work that uh, my office has been doing in the last years, looking at domesticity, looking at cosmopolitics, looking at public space, not as something that is divided uh, clearly through space, but something that is entangled with other things. And that uh, and where design needs to be a little bit more complex to being able to mediate. But this, of course, is also translated to very concrete uh, 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 experiments, actions, uh, prototypes, but also actions in themselves like this house, for instance, in Ibiza, in an area that can only be described normally as uh, rural, but uh, in the way that is colonized by the financial capacity of uh, uh, that, that cities are producing, the capacity for people to concentrate uh, wealth, uh, it's really what is explaining its evolution. This is a house that actually was we designed for an art collector, but we did it in a way that th those forces could be compatible with the maintenance of the uh, ecological wealth of this location and finding ways for the architecture to mediate and make it compatible, the two layers, or even uh, architecture setting limits for the action that uh, these dwellers could bring into the ecosystem. This is crucial because, of course, Ibiza is such a rich ecosystem. But uh, there's really uh, not democratic power at this point to uh, stop the possibility for, build, for people to build in house within the limits of urban uh, regulation. But what architecture can provide is also ways 
uh, for this architectural uh, uh, action to be also uh, uh, not damaging the aquifers, uh, preventing the trees from being from disappear, uh, making it possible for the uh, spills that are damaging so much the soil to be uh, prevented or to prevent from them to be to happen, basically. Uh, this is another work that we developed a few years ago, which is very connected to the, the work on the churches that Kaja was explaining. This is the old minor seminar in uh, uh, Placencia, a city, a colonial city, like one of the cities where the conquerors uh, of uh, some parts of South America came from, like Trujillo or Hernán Cortés, for instance. Uh, this is actually the minor seminar where uh, in the 15th century people at the age of 12 were again being trained to colonize the rural. So this tiny city that again, as, as, as Kaja was explaining, was, uh, uh, it's not a, a major city, it's something like 20,000 people, uh, and never has been bigger than that, but actually had an impact. It was the industry that was preparing for humans to expand colonizing the rural. What is very interesting is that these priests that were uh, trained here, they lived here for a few years and they were trained uh, to basically know how to bring uh, all this urban ideology to the rural when they were, in the, when they were aging were something that was not longer uh, uh, urban. They were kind of a mix between the rural and the urban and they, were, they needed a place to be brought back uh, so they could get uh, geriatric services in a place that uh, was making it sustainable or financially feasible. So our task was to transform this minor seminar into a kind of elder residency where they could, where basically the cost of, uh, of taking care of all these people would be reduced and made feasible. What is interesting is that this building, we thought of it as an embassy that would allow for the, uh, all this knowledge that these people has treasured by being in touch with others uh, in the rural areas could be brought back to the city from the capacity to grow things uh, to the use of energy, their kind of responsibility in using energy, to their knowledge of nature. Many of these uh, uh, traditions that were actually not urban but rural, uh, what is the way that the architecture could enact them and could really promote them as part of the city. So basically, what, what we're trying to do is basically to see what is the way that there's, uh, that the cultural, the kind of uh, uh, exclusive, uh, the uh, stylized or kind of stylist uh, is also related with all the realities that are much more beautiful, much more complex, much more uh, 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 kind of inclusive and much more rich in the way we see them. But how do we prepare also? This is the, the basement of the Barcelona Pavilion, which, in my, which is the place where all the broken pieces of the upper part, the things that age, the experiments that fail, this was the covering of the, of the pond where the Colbert sculpture is. So actually, this is the material that used to plant this. Uh, and it was tested, this plastic, and it didn't last, it would curve with the, with the sun, so it was removed and taken down there to the basement. Or this is the place, for instance, where the employees have lunch. Uh, for me, what is important is to see that there's these other spaces, this kind of what we normally call the footprint, but the footprint is not a kind of collateral effect. It's a real part of the realities we live by, and it's uh, our task to understand the way that we can deal with this entanglement and be responsible to it and, uh, and bring policies, civilized uh, sensitivities, accountability into those relationships. Uh, for the last year, we've been working in Corpus Christi, which is uh, this amazing, oh, in the, this is the Laguna Grande. Oh, this is working? Yeah. Sorry, I think I messed it up. Uh, was it working before? at one point or not? Yeah. Uh, this the Laguna, Laguna Grande is this amazing ecosystem in Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi for many people is, when I ever say, oh, I'm doing a project in Corpus Christi, we will say, well, it's super ugly, Corpus Christi. And then I say, it's a Laguna Grande. And then they say, well, the Laguna Grande is actually disgusting. It's a stinky, it's brown, it's uh, actually super beautiful. And it's such a rich ecosystem. It looks like this from above, but the experience of seeing it from above is not the same that you would have there. It's very different. Actually, for me, it's very important to avoid these kind of representations of uh, things from above or like this, this kind of uh, uh, Google 
image of the globe uh, and we can control where it is, we actually want to uh, uh, move down there and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, actually, this is uh, exactly what we're doing. When you could look down to the Laguna Grande, the Laguna Grande is such a valuable ecosystem. It's so biodiverse, it's probably one of the most biodiverse uh, ecosystems in the US. Uh, but the thing is that the species that are there are not kind of, uh, they, they look uh, rather ugly, and this is actually very nice, but there's <laughs> ugly fish, <laughs> and it's brown, it's too, and it's kind of muddy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's super, super rich, and, uh, but it's very much damaged by two very particular uh, situations that could be found all around the world in rural areas. One is the fact that the whole Corpus Christi is a huge industry for oil, so all these offshore facilities are uh, basically invading the whole uh, co coastal line, and uh, it's not only the, the kind of operational damage that they produce, but the accidental damage, the permanent uh, the site, the permanently the site of of uh, accidents, and there's spillings, and there's boats that are really old and poorly maintained that are throwing things, and it's legal for them to do that. So basically, the whole industry being overlapped with this huge, amazing, uh, amazingly important ecosystem, it's uh, uh, permanently being damaged. The second thing is, of <coughs> course, climate change, uh, sea level rise, acidity in general of the oceans. Uh, all these things that we're seeing and that, of course, we know that are damaging, in very, very particular, these islands in Corpus Christi. Actually, the place where we're working is an island. It's this one here. This house, in, we call it island house or island carry house. And you see that we, we've been collecting, it's been super difficult actually to find information, <laughs> but we've been collecting different images and I would like you to see within time the evolution of the uh, uh, vegetal uh, covering of the of the island. So this is 2004, and you see how different it is from what we saw initially. So in the last decades, uh, basically the uh, vegetal kind of the the vegetal and the trees. Uh, oh, where is this? It's here. Uh, community in the island it's been severely reduced <coughs> due to acidity, pollution, salinity. Of course, the, the lagoon is being mixed with salty water, so the concentration of salt is increasing, increasing, increasing. And as a result of that, you see that also you see the gradients of colors. This is becoming progressively whitish, which means that it's losing a big part of the minerals that are retained in the ground. So the loss of roots from the vegetation uh, implies uh, Im immediately the erosion of the island and the fragility of its borders, and with that, uh, the loss of one of the most important ecotones, ecotones of the of the Laguna Grande, which is the kind of these uh, coastal lines where the uh, where a big part of the biodiversity is produced <coughs> and, and uh, preserved. This is not something that people are not aware of. Uh, actually, there's a huge movement in Corpus Christi, and we're working with them. These are some of the things that they're doing. Uh, from these are promotional vi uh, uh, videos uh, of some of the uh, NGOs and uh, associations, even individual. Uh, oh, sorry, super bad with this. Uh, and we're working with all these people from chefs that are working with the SPCs that they collect from Laguna Grande is a way for people to understand the, uh, the wealth of it uh, to people that are organizing demonstrations. So this is not something that people, people uh, in places like Corpus Christi are not stupid. Obviously, they're totally informed, very precisely, scientifically and politically informed. They have legal advisors, they, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're biologists, they're uh, marine scientists. So it's not that they don't know what's going on, but of course, it's not easy to find uh, or to gather the political uh, influence to, to change things. <laughs> uh, I think that there's things that we can do as architects, and actually technology is part of the problem. So to, and, and we, we're thinking of the way soft architecture can also be part of this, could also be a communicational device, but also be making or providing solutions, and we're doing this tiny, tiny thing here. This is a house, a cabin, actually, that, were, uh, that is replacing uh, a previous cabin that was falling apart. Uh, it's a family that would use this a few weeks a year, uh, so basically they wouldn't use it that much. And what we propose is to do a house that was not catering to the humans, 
but actually would work as a device that would uh, help uh, or cater to the uh, forestry here, to the plants that are still here, and to empower them, or at least slow down the process for, the, for them to be damaged and give space for the whole lagoon to, to be rethought and to give sort of a space as a, princi a principle, a precautionary principle that would allow uh, for uh, humans to gain time and human institutions to, to find ways to deal with this. The idea would be that the house is actually collecting rainfall and it's uh, uh, connected with sensors that are in, uh, inserted in different parts of the island. So when the levels of acidity and condu conductivity, this means sal uh, salt in the concentrated in the soil, uh, increase, they would release this water and basically re reduce the concentration of uh, 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 acidity and salt in the, uh, in the soil. Something as simple as this would really help revert in the cycle of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, erosion of the island as uh, uh, we've been studying it. So the house normally we would present it like this, like this is the, the way humans arrive, they have their staircases, it's a super minimal, minimal house. You can imagine one of the things that we're trying to do is to really reduce the footprint of this in the islands. So you see what, what the bedroom is here and what is the way that we're dealing with space. It's a tiny, tiny house and then it comes to this kind of only single space for everything, kitchen, living room, and another bedroom upstairs. But this is the big part. This is the part where everything starts. It's the collection of water uh, that is from the top. So the, the actual house is more like a reservoir with a minimum footprint and the minimum for people to stay there is more like a, like a tent. We did it with, uh, I mean, this was a huge discussion, but we're uh, designing it with, with Recycle still. Actually, it's like we started to work with wood, with the wooden structure, but it's always our surprise how when, when you really go into the numbers and you really go the, to the calculation to bring wood uh, industrially kind of uh, safe uh, or something that we could rely, we could, we could really use structurally. It means that the, the, the amount of megajoules that are uh, invested in just bringing the, 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 the wood to, the, to this side where there's plenty uh, still available, basically uh, it's much higher than the body energy of the steel. Uh, and this is the and, and this is not something that we're doing as a single project. It's a purpose that we're doing in several rural areas because uh, one thing that we uh, we think is that every single piece of architecture should be uh, engaged with this. For instance, this is a house we're doing in uh, Murcia in another rural area with all these houses you see there are basically units that are totally uh, uh, not taking into account the way the whole area of Murcia that in the past, pre-industrial past of Murcia, pre-carbon emissions past of, of Murcia was, under, was understood by the Islamic culture as a, as a huge garden and that uh, biodiversity is being lost in the last years. That's actually water gardens, what you see there. So what we're, we're doing is this house that Takes, the, uh, takes all the gray house that the house is actually producing, all the uh, organic material, and it's creating this cold one that you see that in that elliptical garden that is basically uh, reproducing and kind of creating the conditions, pre-industrial conditions for the species and the biodiversity that still kind of exist in a tiny uh, uh, way in, in Murcia could be preserved and could be again, uh, again in a continuum. Uh, we see this as a little bit of an activism project. If uh, all these houses around here were uh, investing like a tiny amount of money in just using their, the water that they throw into the sewage system and the organic material that they're putting into a system that is basically using trucks to take things away, uh, basically things uh, would totally change in the territory of Murcia. And we're doing the same in the school that is also in a rural area. And I would like to finish with uh, a few kind of slides of this project. Uh, because we're, again, like I think that in the same way that the urban is invading the rural, and it's our task to use also urban capacities to turn uh, the, the, uh, the effects of architecture, to, re to use them to reverse processes that are really damaging the rural, I also think that there's a question about how the urban can be ruralized. And what is the way that we can also make the best of the uh, presence of the rural within the urban? This is a project that we're doing in uh, uh, Venezia, uh, the TBA, the Thyssen-Bornemitsa uh, Contemporary Art Academy in uh, Judeca, 
It's this San Lorenzo church and a number of other buildings that we're transforming. But I don't, I'm not interested in that image. I'm interested in this one because the whole foundation of Venice is actually, actually uh, the result of the Dolomites, the forests that were cut very close to Venice uh, and were mobilized to basically make it possible to stabilize the, the islands of Venice that constitute Venice. All the foundations are basically uh, a kind of rural, natural construction, being engineered to stabilize the land. So all these uh, forests that no longer exist are concentrated now. This tiny point uh, in the geography of Italy is basically the result of mobilizing that huge extension of forest that no longer exists. Actually, when we see Venice, it's inevitable to see in the areas that are not that well cleared how nature is bringing back, is being brought back. And actually, these days, are, we're not only seeing, this is actually from today, this is not only coming in the form of that, but basically nature is that. So it's very important not only for architecture to do things, but also to undo things. This is the way, this is a, uh, this is a very old uh, 14th century image of what Venice looked like. And this is basically a rural settlement. Uh, we can see how the land, the presence of the soil, the, the uh, uh, vegetable gardens, the, the, the kind of coastal line is something that was totally integrated in the city. These are images and maps that we've been collected in the last two years. These are parts of the Venice that are still like this and that tell us what's the story. This is the way uh, the Marta del Canale, Campo de Santa del Canale looked uh, in the 19th century. So what is that that we've done to uh, the mediums we live in to basically divide, produce this huge divide between nature and the urban, rural and the urban? And what is the way that we can do this? Because I think that's the, the basically our task now. What is the way that we can really learn about what's happening in this part of the architecture of Venice? Uh, this part that is highly controversial, this is where the sea level rise will operate, to basically bring back the rural and find other ways for architecture to coexist. These are parts of our project there that is probably long to explain. But it's actually an embassy that is trying to connect the oceanic system with the particular architecture of San Lorenzo. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you very much. Katia, Noah, and Andres for putting, for participating in this, and, and, and I'm looking forward to discussing this with you. So this is two talks. First, as an architect, because I, I thought that um, that what one does and what one think not always align, and I wanted to um, have a discussion about what I think, but I, I know that I have to present it from who I am and what I do. And so, in the Hudson River, over the last 20 years, I've done six projects. And so I'm going to pre present these three of these projects very quickly. Um, and of course, I'm looking to these projects from New York, which is my base. So the first project is Dia Beacon. It's a building of 1929 that was a factory for Navisco. So the Navisco factory was the, the cookies were done in Chelsea Market, were now, you know, at Chelsea Market, and then the boxes were done in Beacon, and they were connected by train. <coughs> and so what is that, urban or rural? Uh, the, the grain was coming uh, not from New York State, but it was coming from uh, other states via freight, via train freight. And so this building was abandoned for 40 years before we uh, worked on it. And it was a $27 million, it started at $17 million, went to $27 million like to for 300,000 square feet. That's $90 per square foot. Just to give you an example, the MoMA uh, addition that just finished, it's $700 million uh, for the same amount after a $700 million uh, renovation that was done 10 years ago. So it's $1.4 billion <laughs> for something, the same, the same amount of square footage. Uh, that we're talking about. Uh, right now, there are 68,000 visitors a year to the Beacon, 250 about a day. When we were designing this, we thought that the parking lot was too large uh, because we were thinking, you know, maybe 20, 30 people a day would come, a thousand people a, 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 a year. It's a daylight-only museum. 
Uh, summer hours are different than winter hours. It's open until 6 p.m. in the summer and until 4 p.m. in the winter. It was completed in 2003 before we had LEED certification. Um, and so this is the building and of course we inherit a beautiful building to start with. All we did was not to mess it up, not to put ourselves too much in the equation. And so the parking lot has the same column grid as the columns inside, except that the columns on the outside are uh, trees. We plant it as apple trees, but apple trees are harder to maintain. And so these are crab apple trees that are easy to maintain. I would much rather have you eat apples from your parking lot, but that, that, that was an image we couldn't carry. So mm -hmm. I'm going to just show very quickly. So a lot of things were done, um, for example, they don't really have an expression. Uh, for example, the screws and the, and the wood, it's designed in a certain way to be efficient and beautiful and long lasting. But so stainless, stainless, three, stainless steel screws are three times the price of a regular screw. But instead of five cents per screw, it's 15 cents per screw. But a stainless steel screw can be there forever and it's water, there's no waste in it. So uh, that's, w so the, the detailing is so that there's no maintenance and there's no repainting and there's no uh, extra effort uh, to maintain the building. Um, also, there are some additions in the building. I, today I took, I only showing the slides of the finished work I'm not showing the work that it was done because my objective is that you do not see my work, that you see the result, but not actually the work. Um, reci we recycled the wood from one building, 60,000 square feet, repair the other, and then put so concrete uh, in one part. And so it's a daylight only museum. And so the way it, we capitalized on the light was by making a white roof. Uh, and so there's more light inside than outside because it magnifies, it, re it reflects. <coughs> and we did uh, all the installations with the artists. We developed all the details with the artists. That's Michael Heiser and his dogs. Uh, the only light, there's emergency light, and then there is uh, light for art installations. And then there are a, a lot of other art-related projects in the Hudson Valley um, that have created a kind of corridor. Atlas Studio, Magazino, Polyx Talix Foundry, which we work with, uh, Art Oh My, and then of course there's culinary culture and a lot of uh, um, institutions of higher learning. This is a house uh, that I'm, do, I'm working on now. It's a $4 million house, 3,000 square feet uh, for a couple. It's off the grid. It's uh, solar energy, geothermal uh, um, heating and cooling. It has a satellite so that it will be off the grid. Septic system, it has a water catchment, uh, and it has an electric car. Uh, that is solar charged and lives here. So the, the couple that uses this house does not own a car any other place. They move in public transportation to this car, to this house, but this house will need a car because there's no way to get from the train station to the house um, other than by car. This is the land. This is a sketch that in, in the beginning I always envisioned the couple that commissioned the house to be on high heels. I, I always envision her on high heels in the house. <laughs> um, so it's in nature, but it's very urban. Uh, this is the land and um, the house, it's built to appear to be one story house and to tack the, the car underneath. Uh, so this is the view from uh, when you approach the house and that's the view from the trees, nobody will see that view. This is a house under construction. <coughs> it's concrete. Um, this is a house under con construction. 
This is the uh, <coughs> mechanical plan uh, as the mechanical installers were there last week. And I took a picture because I thought there's a lot going on. Uh, that's the, so this is for two people, 3,000 square foot tiny house. It has a mechanical equipment, um, probably bigger than this building, uh, because it, it's all transferring of other energies into electrical energy. Um, so this is a geothermal well that is being well, it's being drilled so that uh, the house can be comfortable without um, being on the grid. These are uh, the window frames, uh, aluminum window frames that will go in these openings that's being installed. It's a high precision frame. The glass came in today. It's, this is a window. Um, the glass, you know, I don't want to even think about the footprint of the glass. <laughs> um, and so uh, the kitchen, the living room, the bedroom, the owner in the bedroom, this the gym. And this is another house that is also for a couple. Um, it's, a, it's a state that used to belong to um, uh, Bigelow, the French, the uh, American ambassador to France under Lincoln. And so this couple bought this estate that has been vacant for a while. And so this is the, ha the estate with our renovations. This is what we imagine will be. And so there, there are few things that we're proposing. And then we're proposing like three different piazzas or places. One is uh, where the offices will be. These people will, are moving to this house to work. So this will be the campus for uh, his office. Um, then they, they, they are going to they are going to move by water from the train station to to the house. Uh, they also plan to commute by train. Uh, and so this is the farm piazza with that we have a farm to the north, and then a, a chicken coop uh, behind the farm. And these are things that we're planning. And then we're planning a swimming pool in the front and a new kitchen, but we're probably keeping most of the house as it is. And so this is the view from the house, from the pool to the other shore, uh, the house, the pool, the view from the pool to the other shore, from the shore to the other pool, of course, intentionally with this kind of rendering. And this is. Uh, the other part of the lecture, the critical part. So um, this is a bumper sticker that I saw in Costa Rica uh, when I was traveling a few years ago. If you love nature, don't visit it. And then, the, then we befriend the guy that had the bumper sticker, and he had another sticker inside his house. If you love art, stop buying it. And so this is. So what am I doing? You know, what am I doing if I love art and I love nature, yet I'm doing a house and I don't buy art, I trade art with my clients that are mostly artists, and so I, I trade art and I have an art collection, but what am I doing? And so a way that, that I sometimes think about what I'm doing is that, you know, when you have a, scar when you have a cut and it will not heal by itself, right? It, you have to heal it, but you're also altering um, uh, altering the course of nature. I mean, that what would happen if you didn't stitch a cat? And so I'm thinking that a lot of the things that we do is um, work on things that are bleeding. Um, and so I, I, I like this idea of uh, suturing landscape or cities. And, and I think of cities not as beginning and end. I, you know, one of the things, the article that you sent, Katia, was so good in, in thinking, you know, how do you count, account for a city? Like, where would New York City end? And, and so when you see, think of cities, you think about this, uh, uh, well, this idea of transect is very interesting, too, to think about these stages of cities. Um, and then the other thing is, like, did the city create the economy, or did the economy create the city? 
The city and the economy are interlinked. The city needs the economy to control what it doesn't have, to control the energy that it doesn't have, to control the food that it doesn't have. And then there is this other <coughs> idea, um, Vishan Shrakavati, this idea that if the se seven billion people that we are were willing to live at the density of New York City, we would all be in the state of Texas and we could leave the entire rest of the world untouched. Which is, of course, not a possible thing, but it's a very good visual image to keep in mind because it, we could actually replan our ground completely. <coughs> of course, this is, this is a very naive, purposefully naive way of thinking of it, right? And then there's Bernard Schumi, our uh, previous dean, where he says, you know, architecture is not about the conditions of design, but about design, design of the conditions. Is it really? Can we really design the conditions? And so I I'm thinking this is like a mountain, like a real glass mountain. It's a very impressive building when one sees it. Uh, and this is uh, a mountain in the middle of the city in Rio de Janeiro, several mountains that are part of the fabric of the city. Um, and this is a very key, in, key person for, uh, Joseph Boyce is a very key person for me to think <coughs> about uh, what we do and how to be critical of the things that, that we are. And so he was, a, he fought for the Nazis, German fought for the Nazis. Uh, his plane collapsed in the middle of Russia. He, bur his, he was totally burned. And so Russian peasants rescue rescue him, cover him in animal fat, kept him for months, and then he returned to Germany after the war and became an art student and an art professor until he was fired as an art professor. And then his art practice was one about merging um, nature, art, pacifism, uh, and political political ideas. And so one of the pieces that Dia owns of Joseph Boyce, it's called A Thousand Oaks, and it's a commitment of Dia to plant A Thousand Oaks. They, they have planted about 40 in Chelsea, but so it's an ongoing project. Another piece of Joseph Boyce, uh, he uh, moved into a gallery in 1970s and lived with the coyote for a month. And so the idea was that the coyote is an indigenous animal of the Americas, and uh, he was uh, he was proposing himself as a conqueror, and so he was trying to re-orchestrate the relationship between na the land and nature and the coyote and the human that comes into the territory. And so he lived with the coyote in this kind of um, kind of suspended tension for a month, and you could come see him. Uh, this is another uh, um, architect that, uh, or engineer, Eladio Dieste from Uruguay. He did buildings with brick, and everything was brick. The floor was brick, the walls were brick, the roof were brick, the structure was brick, the decoration was brick, and so the idea was that, and the bricks were always local, and so the idea was that local bricks um, are, if you take, if you make a foundation, take the earth, make bricks, in the eventuality that the building, it stops being used, it will <coughs> go back to being dirt. And so it's a circular process. That's the structure and the wall, and that's the end. Thank you. I, I was sort of, um, Traumatized a bit by that image of the hand, and I. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. Yeah, and then you were looking at your hand, and I thought maybe that was you. But I no. You were looking at your right hand, and that was the left hand, so I felt okay. But um, I, I wonder about um, what you know. You said if we don't suture a wound, that it won't heal. But of course, sutures haven't always existed. Um, 
And there's something probably incredibly fascinating about what happens if you do just leave it. I mean, in some cases, obviously, you wouldn't want to do that, and probably in most cases. But if you did, it, it, it would resolve itself, the body would resolve itself in some way. And I wonder how that, um, you know, trying to impose that logic onto the, the, the city versus the rural, the, urban versus the rural, whether it's necessary to create something that is as um, pharmacologically sound as a suture and a bandage, and whether there might be something valuable in leaving it to heal on its own. And I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, I mean, I wonder about that. You know, uh, I, I think anyone that has dealt with any medical situations in their life, you know, right now I have a toothache, a toothache right? We have things, and we always wonder what is the relationship of involving medicine, and it's a complicated one. Sometimes it's 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 sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't, and we make certain judgments, and and I think in architecture. Um, it's similar. We are at a point where uh, we need to examine, you know, damage that we're doing. If, I guess what I'm saying is like there's a difference between the intention and the actual action. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just throwing that idea out there for all of us because whether you are a, a theoretician or a practicing architect, you deal with the degrees of that implication. I think that's where, you know, some of these examples in Germany that are very light and, and sort of pilot projects um, play a role, but rather than sort of uh, forcing the intervention um, when you are working in a resource scarce environment, you're often sort of um, uh, faced or you're uh, forced to improvise, you're forced to sort of you know, tread lightly to test out whether a larger investment is even sort of worth the file or whether it would be accepted. Um, and we had an interesting conversation um, when we talked earlier about are these places really resource scars? And some of your projects suggest they're not at all. Um, or what you suggested with the image relating to fracking is also that that, you know, there are enormous resources, especially in rural environments, but they're in the hands of large co corporations that have been extracting and creating these sutures in the environment for um, a long time in the, to, sort of to support an urbanization or a city. Um, and and I, I kind of feel like this image of we would all fit into the size of Texas is completely ignoring the, the extra capacity that we need to support population, even if we were to live much denser. Yeah, you know, with the, the, yeah, I think this discussion is very interesting. Uh, but design is happening yep. all the time. So it's, uh, we were, with, with the study I'm doing here, uh, we were traveling to Wigan, uh, Illinois, and we had a meeting with some people from the silica mining industry and they told us that they're already planning for nine, 99 years ahead. Uh, so they're 99 already, year? Yeah, years ahead. Like basically, yes. they already know what they're going to be extracting in, in a century from now. So, so it's, while architects are, with this, are having this discussion whether we should be planning or not planning, we should kind of leave things to flow, uh, there's others that are planning. <laughs> Well, I, I think the question is not whether we do things or not, or whether architecture should stop and we should have a moratorium, because that's not really happening. Like basically what is happening is that there's a way to construct uh, territorial uh, realities that is unscrutinized, that is really concentrating power, that is, and I, I think it's very important for architects to, uh, to know what our legacy and our kind of traditions are. And our traditions, when it comes to the city, but also to the rural, are very much about accountability, creating public space, uh, uh, providing forms of urbanity, and kind of civilized ways of coexisting. And that is something that, in my opinion, we should not do. Uh, because somehow lose. Like, it's something that somehow if we don't do that, if we don't do our job, 
the site will still be happening. There will be homes, there will be roads, there will be extractions, there will be actions on the rural. The only thing is that they won't be are, are kind of thinking of urbanity. They won't be thinking about distribution or kind of equity. They're not, they won't be thinking about uh, sort of civilized ways of creating societies, but rather about other goals like extraction concentration, of capital, and I, I think our role is mostly that. It's a kind of, uh, at this point, uh, uh, mm -hmm. in my opinion, a practice of certain kind of dissidents. Of course, not super radical, but certain, certain levels of yeah, dissidents. Yeah, but, but I think that that would assume that we are better. I, and I, and I, want to, I want to agree with you. <laughs> I want to agree with you, but um, you have to be, it reminds me of, um, an architect friend of mine who, work, who, who went to work for Doctor Without Borders. Mm -hmm. and, and so he spent 30 years working in Africa building hospitals. And then he was here for, for a trip and we went to have dinner and he said that when he returns to a village where he has put a hospital, he sees all the other things that came with the hospital, the drug tests, uh, people that are uh, alcoholism. He, he said before, People would die in a, you know, in a, in a hut by by their village. Now they go to the hospital, but the hospital brings an entire host of other things from our world to them. And so I think I think this idea that yes, we can do things better, and it, they will happen without us, and they will be worse. Yes, but at the same time, uh, we are part of the problem and the solution. We are not better than the problem in a way. But in my opinion, there's two things here. One is, I'm sorry. But I'm, I'm, I'm just um, very interested in this because I think if you if you understand, you know, the patches that we have, urban, non-urban, rural. I mean, they're all in a way dominated by someone, some agency or not, right? Like mm -hmm. um, I think Andrea's saying. And when you when you kind of go, you know, from the top view down, there's a lot happening, and it's and who is you and who is me. You know, and if you think about all the indigenous population, if you think about now, I, I, it almost seems like we're kind of like going back and, and, and you know, looking at Zapatism, you know, looking at, you know, Korea. Korea is kind of the epitome of modernism, but it's really, really the whole richness of Korea was, you know, like thousands of little farms that until 30 years ago were the basis of the economy. So I, I agree with you. I think it's really like how we position and who when you're saying me and them, you know, this question of alterity. I mean, you know, like you said in your presentation that you show the island, I mean, people there are not stupid, mm -hmm. right? And I think, I think the kind of catch is also how do we position the me with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. I mean, in a way, I have the feeling that uh, there's two things that we're discussing. One is like, uh, I mean, like any other professional body, we have certain kind of uh, contributions to society, I would say. And it's not that we maybe it's not that we're better, but we have certain responsibilities. Like others have others respons other responsibilities. We have a few that we have to care about. And, and I think that it's not easy for us because we are not fully independent. We have to gain the support of others to do our work. We have to convince people. We're kind of an agent among many. But it's true that we have certain agency. An agency that we negotiate, but also an agency that allows us to contribute with something. The, the second question that I think, uh, Galia, you're posing, which is super interesting, is the distance between the intentions and the effects, right? And I, I'm thinking, I, I, I agree with Kaya that the, the cases that you, you saw today were super relevant because they were happening within time. And I think probably it's about the how. How do we intervene in a way that there's, uh, I mean, I, I was very, very excited about the uh, development of the principle, the precautionary principles in the environmental policies of the European Union because it was basically about this. It was about the, when we're doing something that we don't really know how it's going to work, and it's a, a sensitive issue, we have to prototype things. We have to do a small test and then scale it up progressively. So there's space, time, accountability. So those unpredictable effects that maybe are not aligned with our intentions 
could show before it's uh, massively produced and it's too late to, to correct them. I, I, I also think there is sort of, you know, the question is whether we're acting as an agent for the public or the public good or in the name of the public. And that's maybe a more way to frame it as sort of a general assumption that, that we could do better because we as designers or architects are always just, you know, at the end of the day, we're doing something in service of our clients and, and we don't always have the choice to, you know, to choose our clients, but often our clients choose us. And um, if the pub general public is the client, as was in some of the projects that I showed, then, then you sort of have a, a different agency and a, and a different ambition for the project. But I also want to come back to this idea of how that might be different in a rural environment versus um, the city, where um, I think in, in some cases I would make the would want to make the case that there is um, very often sort of a more um, a, a, a kind of notion to um, rely on traditional techniques of building or thinking about the built environment. The, the sheer connection to nature of, of outside your window, outside your door, often leads to different solutions, um, which was sort of exemplified, for instance, in the, um, in the example of the, the sheep barn that's now being used as accommodation but was built entirely out of materials from the region. Um, and so I think there, there's sort of something where we can, in an urban environment, maybe learn a lot from people who um, live in rural environments of how can we break them in the same way we make an emphasis on teaching children about food that they aren't growing themselves anymore. Can we also make an emphasis in urban environments about the materials that surround us in our buildings and, and um, in the objects that we use to get a better understanding where they come from or what energy is needed to produce them. I think that, that um, you know, the, the idea of the public is one that I would like to throw into question a little bit because, you know, as I was trying to draw out in my presentation that we, we can't uh, assume that these things are static, number one. Number two, there's, there's a kind of, um, you know, enduring belief that the rural community is a, is a much more homeostatic one, that it's not changing, and therefore is more embedded in tradition, therefore is more easily um, served by certain types of participatory practices, whereas the urban is the more cosmopolitan, is the one where there is a greater flow of uh, different people coming in, and I'm, I'm not sure that that's gonna continue to be the case, and I wonder what happens when that balance of the urban and rural, you know, the, the urban being a, a community in flux and the rural being one that's deeply rooted, when that is either reversed or complicated or problematized, and then the, the question of who that public is becomes more complicated as well. Um, I just want to throw in a tidbit. So I, I live in Western Massachusetts, which is a very rural place. Um, and it's been very interesting for me to discover the kind of architecture that happens there because the Living Building Challenge is one of the things that people are very excited about in Western Mass. Somehow we have the highest concentration of living buildings in the US. I don't know how that happened. But um, I also wanted to introduce the idea that um, in rural spaces, there's a democracy to nature um, and there is a democracy to the openness of nature that is very enjoyable, and I think it goes a little bit with the presentation that you did about Germany, with that tr with that connectivity in between towns, where you're assuming that the movement is not necessarily from building to building, but that the movement is also outside, um, and I think that that is the only monothematic aspect of the rural, if you want to call it something, is that there's this. Real connection to the outside versus the urban, where we are very much experiencing interior to interior. Even if the interior is outside, it's still earth. It's still concrete. We're still in a very inny space. So, 
I, I want to respond to you and, and then maybe also to you. Um, so, so I think here in, in the region, just one of us, the Hudson Valley is a perfect example of, of that fluidity um, of uh, demographics or who the public is, and it's changing very rapidly. And you can see, I mean, you can sort of see the articles about the Brooklynization of the Hudson Valley, and it is a, a result of. Um, economic pressures in the city that are spilling out into um, the region and um, or kind of fluid lifestyles like the uh, your clients have um, that is also beginning to manifest itself actually in elected offices. So, so a lot of the local elections that happened you know, just uh, a few weeks ago um, were that are now you know a growing number of young people have moved to the region recently are participating in the public discourse in their small environments. Um, so, so I think that's that that's certainly something that I think we we're beginning to see more. And, and again, it's a relationship to this urban rural continuum that allows that to happen. That. Um, the exodus from rural environments to the cities is now is, is being reversed, or it's going both ways um, uh, for economic reasons. Um, sorry, I forgot what I wanted to respond to you, but I'm also sort of time conscious and see that there are more comments or questions from the audience that we should maybe integrate. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about the title and how we do dialogues with the rural. And I was thinking particularly in two projects we presented, the housing the island, mm -hmm. and then the four million couple house. <laughs> and how they are both, what I presume, uh, off the grid, and the difference on how they actually mm -hmm. achieve that. Do you see a friction between those two projects and the dialogue they have, or do you think it's just a matter of permanence? How long you have to do this? Friction. Uh, so friction between if, if these uh, four clients, you know, my couple and uh -huh. uh, and um, Andres group, <coughs> were going to get together, they would get along perfectly well. They probably are friends. They probably go to the Aspen Institute together, or you know, some <laughs> other place. Uh, so uh, I'm seeing with the clients that I have now something similar to with the clients that I had 20 years ago. That were um, artists that had no money whatsoever, that had no shows, uh, and now they actually don't know uh, how to navigate the world as it is now because they have waiting lists. They're not rich because uh, artists are not really the rich type in a way, but they are people that whose work is value, and so they are always under pressure to produce another show, to, pro to, to sell to this collection, to go to LA and install something in that, that museum. And their lives have changed dramatically. Um, and, and, and I feel like the people that are now in the, in, in the um, internet industries, in, the, in, the, in all these new industries, and they, they go public and they go, you know, I, I just had the project cancel a week ago because they were, their company went public and it didn't go well. And so many times they do this huge um, circus and it doesn't work. And, and so it, it is very similar to artists' careers in a way. And it's kind of like um, where our, so would they get along? I think they would get along. Uh, they are kind of deep. I, I think they would probably are misfits of society in some way. My clients definitely are, um, but it's it's the, uh, my couple wants a house that protects them because they are nerds. They protect them from the environment. They don't really. They want to be there, but they're afraid. You know, they're afraid of nature in a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, it's a good question. In a way, I have the feeling that the, the clients of this uh, house is not really the, only the owners of it. Uh, it's really the whole lake, or the whole lagoon. So, and that's really something that needs to be constructed because the, uh, the people that are kind of doing the investment of doing this house, they're really what they want. They basically want a cabin to go to the island. 
their relationship with the with the lake is not that maybe they're not that uh, informed of the value initially. Like I think your clients are very aware, of, right, of, of this kind of environmental uh, kind of dimension of what they're doing. These clients are really learning it through the process of doing the architecture. In a way, the architecture is a way to communicate with other, with these other clients. And normally, they, they had already a cabin there that was basically destroyed by the water, and, the, and they would go there to get, I mean, this is sometimes, what was that? Hmm? Like basically, it's a place for people to party. It's a place for people to party, and that's uh, in a very simple way. And that's the case normally with this island. So it's, it's uh, do they have the resources to do it? Yes, of course they have it. But I think it's a slightly different society in the way that uh, it's a society that is very much embedded in the oil industry, in this kind of idea of. Uh, a very, very dominant way of uh, related to nature. <coughs> the house is actually a device to reverse that in a way. And the fact that we're working with activists and biologists, and it's also, we're, we're involving them in the discussion. So they're, they're learning more about it. And that's something that we found in the rural. We, when we were looking at the, and that's a specificity, when we were looking at, for instance, people living in Susquehanna Valley, it was amazing, many of the activists were selling their mineral rights. And activists again. And of course that complexity is very interesting because they if they don't do it, they can frack from their neighbor's house. So at the end it's the same but they don't get any money. And all these uh, complexities for me are really telling about the kind of the contemporary condition of all these contradictions mm -hmm. that we have to navigate and we have to give a I think we're here to basically try to find uh, ways to reorganize that complexity, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, I'm just pointing to the moderator. <laughs> oh, I'm a moderator? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll call him. Um, I just wanted to kind of clarify a point on this with you. Um, Venice was not built just because of two forests from the Dolomites. The entirety of the Croatian islands were deforested over time in order to build not just Venice but other places. I think it's this, I mean it's not you, but it's this typical like Western bias against anything Eastern as having a contribution to um, the matters of Western Europe. So just so you know, if you go to most Croatian islands, they used to be very heavily forested with native virgin oak forests. And they all form the kind of basis of the, the exact section that you showed of, uh, of Venice. Uh, but the point that I wanted to make, and it made me a little bit really grumpy, so I apologize if I'm a, a little provocative. But like, I'm just so surprised that no one is questioning this term, um, like or Neil Brenner. Like, like, why is the rural a form of urbanization? Like, you know, I can understand that they're interrelated, but why? I'm just so surprised that no one is questioning, like, why should we can't talk about the rural on its own terms. It's like using, like, to using something that it is not to explain that which it is. It's like, you know, you wouldn't call a woman a non-man, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So it's, I'm, I'm being a little kind of uh, purposely provocative, but I think that the kind of architectural inclination to look at the urban, the rural from the standpoint of the urban is really basically a lack of, like, not, not you guys, but like kind of competency. Like we don't understand the world. We don't understand that scale or that way of intervening within a territory in order to be able to talk about it in real terms, right? So no one talks about like vernacular architecture. We all talk about things that are, you know, kind of designed from some other cultural standpoint. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I, I I'll totally agree with, with you. When I was putting the sites together, the images together, <coughs> the image that kept coming to my mind is that I was like a gynecologist of the beginning of the, the beginning of the 19th century when, when they were all men and they were gynecologists you know and, and I feel like an architect is a little bit of an old person to do to, to operate on the rural because the rural has had amazing infrastructure for centuries you know and and here we come and uh, is there a 
with our book of doing things in cities, and we are going into the territory of the rural with, you know, being educated mostly in urban environments. All, all the classes that we take are about the city, the city, the city, the city. So I do agree with your point, and I think it it, it will require this generation of people to, to think and to, to study everything that has been done. Um, yeah. I mean, I understand why you say that, but the point that the, the, me the metaphor of the <coughs> woman and the non woman is actually very good because, uh, because basically it's not that easy to make that distinction. You know, like to make a distinction between what's a woman and what's a man, of course, is very questionable. And from that perspective, from a trans perspective, for instance, I think that uh, we can understand very well how also critical it is this divide between rural and urban. Because it's, uh, it's uh, and I, I would go to your first argument, basically whatever piece of rural that we see is not uh, untouched, it's not a given, it's highly constructed. And it's constructed with tools that are connected to the to realities that were happening in cities, that were con uh, connected to the institutions of the cities, with the infrastructures of the cities, are also the result of the way cities colonize the rural. And I, I understand that you're, you're, you're trying to, you're, you're defending that there should be a, there's a need for a kind of a specific knowledge about the rural, and I agree with that. But I would question the, ca the categories. Actually, when I was talking about the city, I was also saying that the rural is in the city. And in Venice, you can see that easily. You see the animal, you see the crop. But you can see it in New York. If you look carefully, you see the rural in the city. So I agree with you, but somehow I think it's a double thing. I, if that incompetence uh, is about architects not knowing how to look at the rural, probably we also have the, the incapacity to see at the city and find the rural in it, or to find the, you know, and, and I, I think that the problem is not us. In a way, it's, it's actually a, a kind of our modern culture like really needing to, to understand that uh, things are not that pure, that there's interconnections, interdependencies, that there's not real lines, and that probably we have to look much more, kind of situate much more in specific situations our thoughts rather than kind of generalizing. And, and in regards to the, to for instance, when we intervene, it's hardly impossible to find a place that is not already super transformed. Mm -hmm. And- uh, But that doesn't mean that it's urban. It doesn't mean that it's urban, but it means that it's not that the notion of nature that we have, or the notion of uh, the rural, is not really the one of the 19th century, like looking at the and and that in a way questions the whole kind of division between the binary distinction between. So your point is very relevant, and I think that I would say that it, from my point of view, it questions not only our capacity to operate within the rural, but our capacity to operate in the binary sense of urban rural. Uh, question to Mike. Yeah, you know, first, first, just a brief aside, because I noticed that I probably should have died in my hair today. I'm going to stand back here. Um, <laughs> I'm not very conscious, but I'm in a room full of young people who shortly will go upstairs and try to make art and hope that they will get jobs making art. So I, sh I should point out lightheartedly like, that there, there's reason by induction, there's reason by deduction, there's reason by analogy. There's also reason by bumper sticker. So just the, just because somebody put it on a bumper sticker that you, if you love art, you shouldn't try to make art or buy art, that doesn't mean you guys can't go out and try to make art and hopefully get paid for it. And <laughs> I, I just I wanted to reassure you know, <laughs> that okay. But, but my, my whole question, I mean, this goes to what I think was a, a very apt comment by uh, the young one over there, um, ruralism dialogues, what I saw were a bunch of very nice, very interesting, I enjoyed them tremendously, but I sort of felt as though I was seeing a bunch of sustainable via rotundas being put in various environments where there aren't a lot of houses close. <coughs> the, the, the Murthia house was was fascinating in that although it had a skinny side yard, it looked as though it could actually have been adapted into a party wall format. And, and, and so with a lot of the buildings, but but I, mean, I, I came here, I guess, expecting that ruralism was in fact um, something about an interest in shaping 
the tiny 2400 mile um, interval between the, uh, the Davos sanctioned super future cities of, of, uh, of San Fran Angeles and, and, and uh, New Yorkington. And the, uh, there would be an interest, and, and, and I said, that's the that school can do it. I'm wondering, is there, I mean, do you encounter, finally a question, do you encounter uh, architects who are concerning themselves with the approach? It's sort of an, in, I mean, this is infill, really. It's like, how do, you, how do you heal up the country? Did Brian Brown Jacksonville, which ate its suburbs in order to become the biggest city in Florida, and you see trucks on chalks, in the middle of in the middle of wild nature, essentially, but not quite. I mean, right, is, is there is there a sense an in, of an interest in trying to? Is there a pro, could there be a project at Columbia to try to take an urban area and provide it's a planning exercise, I guess, but to take an urban area and, and develop some prototypes for actually getting things back in, but mediating the transition. I don't know. St. Louis is built for a million people and has 300,000. Yeah. Is, there, is there an interest in taking St. Louis and, and figuring out what you could do with it? Maybe give everybody black clothing and be hip. And everybody will say, oh, man, right here is like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, um, is, is, is there an interest in that kind of dialogue at Columbia now? Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to speak for all of Columbia, but, but I do want to say that, that your question, I think sort of following up on the earlier comment question, it, you know, it, is this a moralism dialogue? It, it sort of leads to, this is the first attempt to have this dialogue. But I mean, to me, the easiest way out to talk about it is we're interested in areas of lower density of human population, maybe, and, and how that natural and built environment, whether it's touched or untouched, or in which way it's touched, is something that we as <coughs> architects shape, and as Andre said, voluntarily, or you know, we, we either decide to shape it or someone else will shape it. Um, and you're, you're throwing in another environment that, that might fit that description of lower density into the mix that we, you know, other sort of assumed definitions of ruralism that have to do with nature and agriculture might not fit in. That what you're describing is a, a shrinking urban environment. Um, and so, so I don't necessarily have an answer to whether this is of interest to anyone in Colombia um, right now or next semester. Um, but, but I do, do just want to point to the idea of we're, we're not even quite sure yet um, whether we all agree on a definition of what we mean by rural, and I think that was sort of the part of uh, what, was the what the dialogue was about, or the, the idea of having a dialogue, or, and, and hopefully this is not the last time we, we have this conversation to sort of think about areas of um, lower density, really, in, in, in the context maybe of, of a perceived uh, kind of political divide uh, between these lower density areas in this country and these and also in many other European countries. I really appreciate your comment uh, and your question. And I think what um, it's clear to people that are in Colombia that, uh, that we see in the, the effort that Katia is leading is that there's a lot of concentration of thought about thinking about the city, <coughs> thinking about uh, large groups of, of, of population needs, uh, and not so much on the transitions from the city to some places else. Some place else. And so what I've seen in, as a foreigner that comes from Argentina, a, a rural, uh, mostly rural country, um, half of the size of the United States and one tenth of the population, uh, is that uh, when you put your eyes, you know, in 20, 30 years, what I've seen is that a place like Beacon, New York, that is 75 minutes north of New York City, when we started working there in 1999, there was only one store on Main Street that was occupied, and it was a cash checking place. And there was one pizza that was next to it. Those two. Now you go 20 years later, and it's fully occupied. The mayor has a list of people that want a storefront. And so has architecture and urbanism contributed to that transformation? Yes, we all have, by doing all different kinds of things. And so. 
I think it's important that we examine, you know, what has changed and uh, and and what you're saying, you know, there's this uh, San Luis, Germany, this area of Germany with the population, uh, with the median age 50, they all need some retooling. Yet, I would say that in retrospect, when I see what has happened in Beacon, I. I was last week in Santa Fe, Argentina, and I was cautioning people not to rush into wanting ecotourism <coughs> and art tourism and another university, because it's not all good. I guess what I'm trying to say is that some of it is good, and some of it is, the success of things, it's also problematic. And we, we kind of need to work in a, in a, way, in a framework where we account for, um, for you know, s s the problems that come with success of any kind in our work. I wanna, it's kind of a addition to Dermot's comments and the ruralism dialogue. In terms of the climate change is, is a fact, mm -hmm. and then it's impacting, like let's say, the agriculture and then it's generating like migration into the cities. And we see like in the future cities will grow. Like for example, there's an example like Syria, of course it's not just like for climate change, but it's one of the facts why Syria grows like from four million people to 22 million people so fast. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the future that the cities are uh, facing, right? And then um, we saw that rural and cities are linked together in some Holland work because are under the same system. Yeah. My question or comment is, so you consider maybe um, in terms of, again, sorry, like for example, agriculture practices is the mistake in terms of how can we mitigate the climate change, for example. In terms of our disciplines, architects and urban designers, is, is maybe about our practices in our discipline. So maybe the ruralism should be within the city instead of touching the rural areas. Mm -hmm. And if it's linked in the same system, should have an impact on the ruralism and prefer the cities for these future migrations and yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you consider like maybe it should be like instead of touching rural, working within the city, designing more like within the city as urban designers, not as rural designers? I mean, when you look, there's two ways of operating. Uh, there's not a control room for climate change. So there's not a, a room in which you can see all the options and choose where, <coughs> what are the best ones, you know, like in the world. Like, let's move everything to the city. Let's put towers here. You know, there's not that level of coordination. It's good that there's not, because otherwise we would be in very absolute, absolutist uh, uh, ways of dealing with territorial issues. So one, what you're saying is very, it's very sensible, and I would say that that's something that there's many people facing now. Like, what is the way that cities will adapt to to the implications, the social implications of climate crisis, and many of them are these migrations. And I work on that, for instance, in Palermo and, and Lampedusa and different places, and it's, it's a huge reality. Uh, but but also, it's important to understand that there's many other sites where architecture is happening now and where that architecture is happening, there's issues that have to do with climate crisis and that architecture needs to be mobilized as any other force uh, in uh, dealing with that. And for instance, for me, uh, the, the opportunities for architects to test things are the ones that <coughs> also can be possible. And uh, I presented today, for instance, uh, two projects of uh, housing, because that's something that architects have a great agency on, and that there's ways to turn them into prototypes of, thin, of ways, of strategies, to deal with realities where architecture has very limited capacity to operate. If you think, for instance, of the possibility of architecture to produce changes by connecting tiny actions, uh, it's huge. And a change on that would be immense. Of course, does it mean that there's no possibility of uh, a not or other people are not in favor of more strategic uh, strategic kind of ideas of how to intervene the cities? No, I think there's uh, uh, there's many different layers of action that need to be coordinated and happening. But somehow I think that is it's also important to be realistic and to do things and to somehow deal with concrete responses to very urgent <coughs> issues. 
And in doing that, I think there's a responsibility, but also a capacity. Often when we think about architects dealing with the rural, we think at the scale of urban design only. I think it's very important that we're discussing this because it's also a, a question about uh, uh, water times. It's about the question about uh, how, what's the, the foundation of a building. It's also a question about the, you know, the way we send, like we, what we do with, with very specific with the fences or how do we stop animals to cross uh, backyards. And all these tiny discussions of design are equally important and we have to give value to them because they scale up by repetition often. And they transform territory by adding mm -hmm. one to one to one to one to one. So we're, it's our responsibility also to give a response at the scale of buildings and from with the tools of architecture. <laughs> we should be yeah, I think right. so. <laughs> yeah. Um, many of us in the urban design studio will have an opportunity to continue the conversation in smaller groups where all of you also get to participate. Thank you, everyone else. Um, for, uh, thank you.